Welcome to Lecture 13.4, Applications of Definite Integrals. This is for Math 1325, Calculus for Business and Social Sciences. What we're going to do is we're going to look at continuous income stream problems now. This is a very simple concept. So let's look at an example. So let's suppose we have an oil company whose profits depend on the amount of oil that can be pumped from a well. We consider that the pump at an oil field as producing an, a continuous stream of income. Since the pump is constantly um, pumping and producing more oil, and eventually we will sell that oil, so you can think of the pump as a continuous stream of income. Because both the pump and the oil field wear out with time, the continuous stream of income is a function of time. Eventually, there will be no more oil. Eventually, the, the pump will, as it says, wear out. So. Um, that the income will eventually be reduced to zero. So let's suppose that we have a function which is the annual rate of flow of income from this pump. This is an average, or excuse me, a rate of change. Then we can find the total income from the rate of income. We can find the total income function from the rate of income by using integration, right? Because remember, integration is antiderivative anti-differentiation, um, anti-derivatives. Since we are given a function that's a rate of change of income, we find the actual income function by integrating. Okay, So our total income is going to equal the integral of that rate of change of income, how it's flowing in, over a period of time from A to B. Okay, So let's look at an example. Bailey Oil. Yeah, you thought I was just a teacher, didn't you? So Bailey Oil is a small oil company that has a well with a continuous income stream with its annual rate of flow at time t given by f of t equals 600 e to the negative 0 0.2 t in thousands of dollars per year. Find an estimate of the total income from this well over the next 10 years. This is a very simple problem. We've been given the formula, the total income given a continuous income stream. We just evaluate the in, the um, integral over a to b. Okay, So our f of t, our function, is given to us. It's in yellow up here. It's really easy to see. The only thing we need to figure out is what are the limits? What period of time are we considering? Since it's over the next 10 years, this we're going to do the integral from 0 to 10. When we plug this in, here we have a simple integral with a constant in front, which we can pull out pull out in front of the integral, remember. And we have e to a function of t. Remember, this is where we do substitution. Um, we set u equals e to the negative 0.2t. Do find du, which is then, of course, that negative 0.2, and then we make sure we offset that with with the multiplier, okay? Which is one over e to the 0.2. I'm not going to walk through this integration. You should already know how to do it to get from this point to the next point. And when we solve this, um, plugging in 10. Um, for the uh, first upper limit, we get a value, and then remember we subtract um, plugging in zero. Now be careful, this is one of the common mistakes. Notice when we plug in zero for the um, bottom limit, a lot of students think that this is going to go to zero. But remember now what it's going to do is the exponent will be zero, and any exponent, um, anything to an exponent of zero is equal to one. So there is a value that we're subtracting here. So make sure you can calculate this value. Make sure you can solve this integral, which you should already know how to do. Now be careful. Also, finally, notice this answer here is wrong. What do you mean it's wrong? because, remember, it tells us up here that the function is expressed in thousands of dollars per year. So if you said that the um, total income from this well over the next 10 years is 2,594, you're wrong. It's $2,594,000, which is also, of course, 2,594,000. Make sure that you are paying attention to units and problems and that you express the answer in a proper way. Again, the total income here is 2,594,000, not 2,594, 2,594. All right, let's look at another kind of problem. Now, the interesting thing is um, we're going to look at three kinds of problems, total income, present value of an income stream, and future value. And you need to know these formulas for the tests and the final exam. And um, if you know the last formula, you can actually build the two previous ones because they all build upon each other. Okay. Oops, where did I go? 
In addition to the total income from a continuous stream, the present value of the stream is also important. Um, why might we want to know that? Okay, The present value, remember, is the value today of a continuous stream that will be providing income in the future. It's useful um, sometimes in deciding uh, when we might want to replace machinery or what new equipment to select, and possibly even if we're trying to figure out if we want to buy something or sell something. Maybe I want to I want to buy an oil well to add to my company. Maybe I want to sell an oil well. And so I might want to figure out what it's worth today based upon some kind of future earning. Okay. Now remember that when we have a continuous income stream, we would use um, simply the value of that income applied to some kind of integral, uh, an exponential. If f of t is the rate of continuous income flow, earning interest at rate r compounded continuously, then the present value of the continuous income stream is the present value uh, equals the integral from 0 to k, where k is the time interval in the last problem, it was 0 to 10, f of t e to the negative rt. Notice this formula is the same as the total income by adding this exponential inside e to the negative rt. So again, each of these formulas is going to build on the last. Okay, so let's look at another problem. This is kind of a plug and play and obviously my PowerPoint is a little bit off so you get the answer up front. It's a little cheating, right? So we're back to Bailey Oil. We have a different function now that's its rate of flow. And we want to figure out, um, again, here I'm trying to figure out the present value of the well over the next 10 years to establish a selling price. So I think that I can find, if I can earn 10% compounded continuously, so whatever money I get today, I can put into an account at 10%, and I'm going to get the same value as the money coming out of the well, the projected total income over that 10 years. So let's do some, some of the calculations. Here's the formula. Let's plug it in. We have 600 e to the negative 0.2 t plus 5. That's the formula given. And then since we want the present value, we now add e to the negative rt. r, remember, is 10%, so it's negative 0 0.01. Okay. Now notice we have two exponential constants here. So let's simplify this before we try to take the integral. Remember that when you have a constant to an exponent times the same base to an exponent, you simply add the exponents. So the only thing that's happening from here to here is that we've multiplied this out, getting rid of the parentheses. So we get negative 0.2t plus, actually it's minus 1, because 0.2 times 5 is 1, and it's negative times positive. So we get 0.2t minus 1 plus another negative 0.1t, so we can combine the variable t, and we get this. Again, know that now we will um, integrate this using substitution, where the exponent, negative 0.3t minus 1, will be the u. Uh, I actually show it here. I didn't think I would. So then the du would be negative 0.3. So I have to offset because I don't have that in there. And now I can do substitution, and I can solve this problem and I get approximately $699. Now you can walk through this. Again, I'm not going to take the time on doing the integral pieces. You should already know how to do this substitution and solve for an integral, and especially a definite integral. Remember, you plug in 10, and then you plug in 0 um, for t, and subtract them, the value for 10 minus the value at 0. Okay. Again, this tells us it was in thousands of dollars, so our answer is not $699, but $699,000. The next thing we're going to look at is the future value of an income stream. Um, remember from um, business algebra that the future value of a continuously compounding in, uh, investment at rate r after k years is the original principal times e to the rk, where r is the um, interest rate and k is the number of years. Okay. Thus, for a continuous income stream, the future value is... If, again, f of t is our rate of change, notice we have the future value equals that e to the rk times the present value, where the principal we put in, and that's the present value formula. So notice, if you remember this formula, the future value formula, oops, sorry. If you remember this formula, the future value formula, notice you have all three formulas in here. 
if you take this first constant off, e to the r k, why is it outside? Because r and k are constants. r is the interest rate, k is the period of time, so e to a constant is also a constant, so we don't have to integrate this. If we drop this, what's left is the present value, right, from the integral on. And if we drop this last multiplier of e to the negative rt, then we have the total income function. So we have all three functions built into the future value. All right, so let's look at another problem here. If the rate of flow of an income from an asset is 1,000 e to the 0.02t in millions of dollars per year, whenever I see this in different unit than just dollars, I want to make a note of it. You might even highlight it or circle it on your test or whatever. And if the income is invested at 6% compounded continuously, find the future value of the asset four years from now. So again, I just plug in these values. I have E, my interest rate is six. My period of time, my interval is four years. So I'm also evaluating this from zero to four to find the present value that I want to times this multiplier. 1000 E to the 0 0.02 T, that is our function F of T. And then of course we need this other multiple, which is E to the R, negative RT, okay? Again, I want to simplify the exponentials, and I get this. I'm going to substitute in u for the exponent, find out what du is, so I can find my multiplier, which is 1 over 0 0.04 or negative 0 0.04. Again, when you do 1,000 over negative 0 0.04, you get negative 25,000. That's where that comes from. And then I evaluated it from 4 to 0. I see I get this. And when I plug this in to my calculator, I get $4,699.05, which is wrong, right? We already know that since this is millions of dollars. So I have $4,699 million, which is actually about $4.69 billion. And actually, since I rounded, this is even a bad rounding job when you look at that. If I'm going to round to two decimal places, notice this should be $4.70 billion. Ah, but we're talking about billions of dollars. What's a billion between friends, right? All right. So let's look at the next piece on here. This is kind of an interesting um, concept, um, especially if you've taken economics, you'll be better suited for this next section. What we're going to do is look at something called production, producer surplus and consumer surplus. This is both labeled producer surplus, but each of these is a different one. This first one is about consumer surplus. And the idea here is that um, if a company charges less for a product than you are willing to pay, if a company charges less for a product than you're willing to pay, then you win. This is the consumer surplus. You can say it in, you can see it in the first sentence, consumer surplus. So the idea here is you're willing to buy an iPad for 500. Apple is only selling it for 450. So you benefit, you have a surplus of $50 to spend somewhere else. And Apple sort of loses out because they could have made an extra 50 on you. Okay. On the other side here, we have the concept of the producer surplus. Okay. Um, and this is where um, the, the company may have a lower target price. So they, you know, most companies have quotas or percentages um, where they, you know, they look at all their costs and then they raise it, let's say, 50 percent, and that's how they determine their retail price. So maybe that they find out that their their target price is 400, but they really believe people are willing to spend more. So they actually charge more. OK, so the market is hotter. It's a hot item. So instead of charging the 400, which was in their parameters, they charge 450. So the company gets an extra $50. So that's their surplus. You, on the other hand, lose because they're charging more for that product. Now let's see what that looks like um, in applications. Okay. So remember that, um, again, if you haven't seen this before, um, typically we have a, um, what's called a, a demand curve and a supply curve. Okay. Here's our demand curve. It's the one curving down. So notice as the price goes up, the demand goes down as the price goes up. Now notice here's our price. When we have a high price, we sell very few items. So the y-axis is our price. P stands for price. And X stands for quantity, like how many we're selling. Okay. So when we have a really high price, we're not selling any. As the price goes down, the quantity sold goes up. Okay. 
The other um, figure is a supply figure, right? And so here it's also a, a function of price and quantity. So if the, if the um, price is low, um, the if the demand is low, we'll probably charge a lower price. If not many people want, um, let's say, a certain kind of, um, I don't know, pet collar, then we're probably not going to produce many or we're going to charge really cheap for it so we can sell them. If demand goes up, if more people want it, then we can probably keep charging more money, right? So if you know millions of people want something, or maybe thousands, we can start charging more money for it. And so we have this equilibrium point where the demand and the supply meet is called the equilibrium price, okay? So this is kind of an optimum price you know, that most businesses will, uh, will um, opt for, looking at the supply and demand curve, okay? All right. So as the demand curve shows, not all would be willing to pay more than P1, which is this point. Um, the, actually, some would be willing to pay more for it. And that's this area here. So notice the people um, that are buying it in the blue areas say, you know, yeah, I, I want this so much. And it, it talks, it gives you an example, like a sold out event, that this is actually the consumer surplus. So if the company um, is charging this price based upon you know their supply and demand model, if they charge a higher price, um, I'm sorry, not if they charge a higher price, all the people that are in this blue area were willing to pay a higher price, and so they all benefit. Okay, so they all benefit from a lower price, so they get a surplus. The consumer surplus is money that consumers save. Um, because the company charges a less price than they're willing to pay. Notice also that this rectangle, it's white in the first and it's blue in the second, is the total revenue at this assumed price. Because if we charge P1 for our product, we're, and this says we're going to sell X1 of our product, that what we're getting here is a, a rectangle, height times width, X1 times P1, the area of that rectangle is the total money we would get, right? If I, um, this is a very simple concept. It may get confusing with the graph. But if I'm charging a price of P1, let's say I'm making TVs, and I sell 20 TVs, which is X1, then I simply multiply those two numbers to figure out how much money I made or my total revenue. Simple concept, very simple graphically as well. Since it's a rectangle, it's width times height, all right? So notice that we just came through a section where we learned about the area between two curves we can find using an integral. The area of the upper curve, which is the demand function, minus the area of the lower curve, which is actually, we already know this, we don't have to put it into the integral. So it's just the integral of the upper function minus the area of the lower function. We could have put the integral in as a constant, but then we just get P1x1 anyway. All right. So this is our consumer surplus function. It's the um, integral of the demand function evaluated from zero to the equilibrium quantity minus the total revenue, which is the equilibrium price times the equilibrium quantity. So let's look at a, at a uh, problem here. In order to solve this for the consumer surplus, the first thing we need to do is find out the equilibrium quantity. It tells us the equilibrium price. It gives us a demand function. And so when the price is $20, if we plug it in here, P equals 1020 over X plus 1, we can calculate what X equals. So we plug in 20 into the demand function for P, because that's the equilibrium price. That's our P1. And then we solve for X, and we get X equals 50. Okay, so our equilibrium point is 50, 20. Okay, the $20, we would sell 50 units. So now we have everything we need to figure out the consumer surplus. The consumer surplus is from zero to the equilibrium quantity, 50, of our function, our demand function, minus, remember, the total, the total revenue, which is our equilibrium point multiplied, so 50 times 20. Again, we have a function here. Um, if we take this integral, 1 over x plus 1, the integral of 1 over an argument is the natural log of that argument, and then we plug in the values and calculate. And here we get $3,010.46. Notice our units are just dollars. 
So this is a good answer. So the consumer surplus is $3,010.46. So this is the amount that the company would lose. It's the amount that the company left on the table because they charged a lower price. Another way of interpreting this is this is the total amount that all the consumers who were willing to spend more actually saved. Okay. Let's look at another one here. Okay. A demand a product's demand function is given square root of 49 minus 6x and its supply function is given where p is the price per unit okay and x is the number of units find the equilibrium point well remember the equilibrium point is where the supply and demand function intersect so to find the equilibrium point first we just set those equations equal to each other and solve for x in this case notice we get x equals negative 12 or x equals 4 we cannot sell a negative 12 number of items, so this answer is not valid. Only the 4 is valid. So when we solve for x, we get x equals 4. We plug it back into either of these equations. 4 plus 1 is 5. 49 minus 24 is the square root of 25, which is also 5. doesn't matter which equation you plug x into. You'll get the same answer because that's what we're looking for is the... Um, Sorry, that's what we're looking for is the equilibrium point of the intersection. So now we're ready to try the consumer surplus function. Remember, this is the demand function, so make sure you pick the right equation. Um, minus the product of the equilibrium point, 4 times 5, which is our total revenue. Okay, again, I, my answer popped up before I wanted it to. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to do a substitution here where the u is 49 minus 6x. Um, the inside of the radical, then my du would be the negative 6dx, and I need to offset that by negative 1 by the reciprocal. Again, you should know how to do this, so I'm not going to spend time here. I evaluate this integral, I get this response, and then I evaluate it from the a lower and upper limit. I plug this all in, and I get 4.22. So the consumer surplus is uh, $4.22. Not a very good problem um, for total consumer <laughs> surplus. Um, we must not be selling uh, very many or they're not that interested. And here's a diagram of that exact problem. Um, so you can kind of look at that and see the response. Okay. So now let's look at the producer surplus. Remember the producer surplus is extra money that the company is going to get by charging a higher amount. Okay, by charging a higher amount. All right. <clears throat> so here, notice we're looking at the supply function. And so what happens with the um, producer surplus is notice we take the total income, the total income, which was the rectangle, divide, uh, um, excuse me minus the integral of the supply function. So we're getting the area, the little pink area that you see in the graph here. So here's our function. We take the total revenue minus the supply function. So this is really key. In producer surplus, we're integrating the supply function. In consumer surplus, we're integrating the demand function. Okay. All right. So let's look at that simple problem. These should be a little bit simpler now since we've done several of these on the consumer side. But remember that you're integrating a different function. One of them is subtracting from the total income and the other is subtracting the total income from the integral. Suppose that the supply function for x million, so I see a million units there, is p equals x squared plus x. If the equilibrium price is $20 per unit, what is the producer surplus? In all of these problems, we first need to find the equilibrium point. We have an equation here. We have the, the price um, equilibrium. So we plug that in, solve for x. And again, we get x equals negative 5, not allowed, or x equals 4. So x1 is 4 million units. And p1, when we plug this back into it, oh, we already have that. Sorry, it was a given in the problem. So now we have all the pieces we need to, to figure out the producer surplus, um, the equilibrium point as a product minus the integral of the supply function from 0 to 4, which is, again, the x value of the equilibrium point. This is a very simple integral. I'm not going to walk through this, and we get 50.67. Be very careful. Remember, the x values were in millions. So we're, our final answer is going to be in million times um, dollars. So we're going to be in million dollars. 